Hey everybody, guess what? It's that time again. We've got another Be Smart podcast featuring none other than your favorite bee hooligans. This is Big Bear, and I'm bringing it to you again right here from South Omaha, because that's the way we do it down here. We we don't just do it, we do it all the way. Uh, we got a bee hooligan with us today. We got Mr. Yappe Travis Albrecht way over there down in uh, Alabama. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the people amongst the world out there which are spending their time actually just pointing out all of my little transgressions, indiscretions, and wrongdoings. Welcome to the podcast. How dare you talk about swarms that way? Uh, You know, it's funny because I'm so missing swarms right now. I mean, just, (laughs) just the whole... You know, a group of bees that are that are actually tolerant more so than not, and let you just manipulate them and oh. play with them and everything else, and don't want to eat you up. And oh, yeah, I miss it. Now, I, I've also been seeing. Yeah, you've been posting a lot of food stuff uh, again, and because uh, I see J, JP and uh, Shaw, we've been picking on you about your dietary, your culinary choices, uh, especially you and your ramen noodles. But I, the one question I've never asked you before, and it never occurred to me before, ever, because they're always talking about weird stuff like hot sauce and ketchup and all that on your ramen noodles. And <clears throat> by the way, folks, getting yap into a conversation about ramen noodles is a whole nother show by itself. So what we're just going to do is I just quick question, yap. Have you ever okay. even thought to put honey on your ramen noodles? I mean, you're, you're a bee guy for, for crying out loud. Do you ever put honey on ramen noodles? Man, there's nothing. Now, see, I, I'm strictly a chicken flavored ramen noodle guy, and you 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 want to throw a tablespoon in on top of it. It uh, it throws a little sweetness in there like no other. But you know, I, so that's all I'm saying. I'm an, an occasional an occasional boost of the very very lack of nutrition in ramen noodles. Uh, <laughs> you know, with a spoonful of honey, it puts it right up there in in its own food group. That's all I'm going to say. It's a culinary delight. Yeah, I don't very know much. I want to take your word for that. So I brought a specialist along today. I've brought, uh, I've invited a, a a friend of a friend. Actually, we've had Kim Flodham. He was co-author of a book called Honey Connoisseur, and uh, because Kim had a lot to do with the plants and the flowers and the pollination information in that book, but when it came to the honey, he tried to talk a big game about it. But I knew who really had the 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 wherewithal to really tell about talk about the actual honey and how it was with a, a, a young lady named uh, Marina Marchese. She's the author. See Marina Marchese. Uh, that's the co-author of that book. And that's, she's actually the one that actually knows the honey part and the, the culinary aspects of it. So without further ado, I'm going to bring her on just to challenge you and call you on this, uh, this honey and ramen noodle thing. Uh, Marina, how you doing there? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Tony. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Uh, we're always talking about food on here. We constant, we cannot, of course, we have Yappy on here and, and between Yap and Shawi and JP, it's always a food thing. Somewhere at some point in time in the conversation, we get to either ramen noodles or real food. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and I've been meaning to talk to Yap about the honey aspect of this and it, it just never really comes up. And uh, today, I thought, you know, it'd be a really good opportunity to do that. So here you are. And I want to ask you, because you co-authored uh, the, uh, the the Honey Connoisseur book, and you've, you've done a lot of cooking, I presume, to be able to come out with a book like that in tastings. And, you know, I mean, the book is awesome, by the way. I love that book because... I'm more in the, 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 the pairings with different, you know, like side. I'm a diabetic, so I'm always trying to find protein. So I got like the little ham slices. I can't have a lot of breaded stuff, crackers and all that. But so I, I love the book because it showed how to pair a lot of stuff like that. But I never thought about pairing something like ramen noodles until I met. Yeah. So <laughs> what is your culinary, your taste there? Tell us about honey and what kind of honey maybe would be best to go with chicken flavored ramen noodles. Well, I think there's, you know, in writing the book and doing the research, um, I came from a background of arts and 
uh, as a beekeeper, I found that I was uh, really a foodie. I really was excited about honey. And when I met other beekeepers and we traded honey and we were tasting honey, I was just fascinated by this notion that honey, you know, from different flowers looks and tastes different. And uh, being a little bit naive, I was looking for the book. I said, where's the book to match the flowers to the flavors? How do I know what flower is going to taste like what? And there wasn't a book. And that's when uh, I was thinking, you know, getting in touch with Kim to do all the plants and to come up with this book concept of identifying flowers and flavors. And uh, I think that there's a honey for everything. There's a, there's a different flavor honey that can go with any kind of food, including ramen noodles. <laughs> See, uh, there's hope for you yet, right? Yeppy. Yeah, there's, there's honey for everything. Um, and on a global scale, I mean, in the U.S., we have so many different honeys. You can travel to different cities and states, and there's so many different kinds of honeys, and even internationally. So there's a honey for everything. There's a honey for every food group and every ingredient. So now you, and, you started out as a beekeeper first. How long have you been a beekeeper? How long have you been playing with bees? I started very naively, accidentally, about 17 years ago. So it was before people were really excited about honey and before people, you know, before we had the, the CCD in 2006 and disappearing bees and people talking about organic and, you know, farm to table. Before that whole uh, movement started, I had just started with one hive of bees just thinking, oh, I have a little hobby, something to do on the weekend. And uh, as I worked with bees and joined my local bee club, it just became so fascinating. I got sucked in like everyone else. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's awesome because, I mean, it's, it's neat. It's cool to be able to come from that background. I mean, I, I've done some pretty interesting, I like to think anyway, some interesting things as an offshoot of my Working with bees, I play with bees is what I tell people. I play with bees. So, and and one of the things that I'm always telling folks around here, I run a uh, an education classes and training program, is that beekeeping becomes so personalized because we all have our own goals and objectives, and eventually, our indi our beekeeping, each one of us, have our our individual beekeeping becomes very personalized because we always we're. We're, we're, we're pulling it towards those goals and objectives, you know, so those individualized ones. So where I might be drawn more towards, you know, I tend to do a lot more with wax and wax products, you know, uh, and, and, and trying to, uh, work with genetics and, and bees, you know, breeding and all that. Uh, other people focus like, you know, go more towards the honey and what they do, those kind of things. So it's always, I always find it fascinating that experience with every beekeeper, it always kinds of pulls out to something really kind of different every time, you know, even, uh, uh, even if, you know, you have two, di two different beekeepers and they both get into the honey side, you know, one of them would be more into the, you know, just bulk sales for whatever. Another one would be into the, because of the cooking. Another one would be into because I know a guy who does it and all he does is for uh, medical purposes. He actually yeah. did a deal set up for the hospital, you know, uh, down in Florida. It, uh, he, he gets a hold of some of that honey down there. And, so, and also, you know, epitherapy and bee venom oh, yeah. and the pollen and the arts and crafts. So it gets so it's, unique. Yeah, it touches everybody's life in some way. Even if you're not keeping bees, bees touch your life in some way. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think we, yep, yep had a little slowdown here, but he'll pop back in, I'm, I'm sure, hopefully in a little bit. But uh, so you, 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 you've you got this this book going. You you didn't see the book. You couldn't find a book. And you're looking for the book. And, you, of course, you said, hey, there's no books. Let's let's make the book. And I noticed you've got a lot of really you cool things in there. You have the uh, lot of a lot of photos. You've got a lot of uh, the charts and the wheel, the flavor wheel stuff. Um, what, how much did you really get to put into this and how much did you just find and were able to incorporate as you went along? Well, it, it's a long story, but honestly, oh, I'm getting a little okay. feedback there. I think Yap's trying to <laughs> jump back in. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah, I jumped, you there? Uh, yeah, I'm back in. Can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can. There's a little echo. Okay, so long story short, 
Uh, I started beekeeping in about 2000, and by 2003, I was really fascinated with honey. I went into I went to the the honey show in London as part of my research to try to find this database of matching flowers to flavors, and it just didn't exist. So that's about the time I started gathering information. So this book has been sort of in progress for about you know, 14 years. And uh, if you remember, I don't know if you know, but my first book was called Honey Bee Lessons from an Accidental Beekeeper. That was published in 2007. But actually, I didn't want to write that book. I had submitted a proposal for the honey connoisseur. I had submitted a book about honey. And the publisher said to me in 2006, nobody cares about honey. No one's going to buy this book. But if you want, Yeah, it was, well, you know, a little ahead of its time. So they said to me, would you write your personal story about coming to bees and, you know, all of the things that you've done with bees? And I reluctantly said yes, because they said to me, well, later on, you can come back and do your honey book. So if you've ever looked at the honey, um, my first book in the back, there's a whole chapter beginning about honey, my talk about honey. So circle around a couple of years after that book. I still had honey on the brain. I was like, you know, there is still no database or book about flowers and flavors of honey. So I had still all of this information that I had been gathering and, you know, compiling and writing. And it became, you know, substantial enough that I came back to the publisher and said, now can I do my honey book? And they said, well, you know, we can see about it. And I said, well, I've got this a co-author that's interested and he's a bee guy and a plant guy and he knows a lot of about this and we're going to come together and do this book and uh, they finally said yes and you know they gave us five months to write the book but in honesty I had been already compiling the information for 10 years and and uh, even though the book now is is just a start there's a lot of work that we have to do as beekeepers and food lovers and uh, plant gardeners. There's a lot of work we still have to do about honey here. So the book is just a start. And, um, uh, I, I'm glad to see that people are excited about honey and, and all of the different flavors that are, uh, harvested around the country. Oh, definitely. You know, one of the neat things uh, about this is it really has started a bigger discussion with a lot of people, especially when you talk about the connoisseur kind of uh, approach to it. You know, I've worked with um, <clears throat> uh, I'm working with a, a group right now, a local uh, craft store, as a matter of fact, uh, Mangelson's in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And we're putting together the the Honey Lovers group. It's going to meet on a monthly basis. And basically, I'm going to kind of using your your book there uh, as a kind of a guide to bring in. I know beekeepers all over the country now. Actually, I've, I've got I know beekeepers all over the world. Uh, I'm buying and bringing in some honeys um, to uh, uh, kind of give these folks an opportunity to learn how to identify and taste and sample and see where they, you know, can, a, can, can they can start to learn to pick up qualities of honey themselves. So they become a better educated honey consumer. And then of course it's a fun way to do that, you know? Uh, yeah. And honey deserves respect. Finally. I mean, for so long, even when I started beekeeping, um, you know, I would see beekeepers producing such delicious, wonderful, honey and selling it for very low prices. And, you know, as a new beekeeper, it took me, you know, about two years to get my first harvest. And I saw how much work that the bees put in and the time and how much time I did. And uh, I just, I always thought that honey deserved a little bit more respect. So it's, it's nice to see that it's coming around and beekeepers are starting to look at honey as, uh, you know, a very unique special food and uh, educating the public about, uh, you know, how how difficult it is. And it's a product of nature. And, you know, it's just uh, healthy and delicious. um, And it's limited. I mean, we don't have honey all year round. People, you know, the, the public needs to understand that it's a very special food. You know, I was, I had a little bit, I recall now, uh, I don't know how long ago. I think, I think it was a little bit when we, uh, off the side after the, 
the recording when we talked to uh, Kim. I had talked to Kim a little bit. I, it's, it's kind of like there's an idea now. We've got this little bit of a split going because you have all the imported honey and, and, you know, we've seen several articles in, in various journals and magazines and in, in different places where you see that, you know, domestic honey has really gone down in production. And it's just more of our stores. You go to a local big chain store shelf, et cetera. More of those really are your imported honeys that might be blended with a little bit of the local they're able to get, yeah. you know, but for the people who sell to those big, you know, packers. But for the most part, it's kind of like there's been a division between your, your commercial honey and, and that kind of product, which is a low price product because it comes in such bulk because they're importing it so cheaply and packaging it so cheaply. But then you've got this, I, I, I almost kind of want to use the word renaissance for domestic honey because people are starting to push that. Um, it's, it, it's like you say, it's a craft almost now. It's like the craft beer scene. If you, if you'll exactly. for the comparison, yeah. people putting so much effort and so much work into their bees and their hives to get these, these honeys. And they're, they're, they're just, uh, so you're seeing this, this, it's this difference of, uh, marketing really. And I think that's part of that, that really interesting aspect is people are taking more pride as beekeepers when they do produce honey because yeah. it's not the same thing. It's just not. It's domestic. It's here and there's differences in quality. And it, and it tastes different, you know, and I talk to beekeepers all the time and, they complain that the cheap imported honey is putting them out of business. But, you know, you have a premium product that was produced in, you know, in the U.S. It's fresh. It's delicious. Hopefully, you know, it's, um, you know, available. But you taste beekeeper's honey side by side with any commercial honey. You don't need to be educated, to taste the difference. And I think beekeepers just to have to just uh, learn about honey, learn about the floral sources and create a marketing plan because exactly. you have a premium, you have caviar and uh, the, you know, the grocer has a $3 imported watered down ultra filtered sweet liquid that they're calling honey. And you know, you, you taste it side by side and the consumer doesn't need to be uh, highly educated to taste the difference. True. So, but I think for them to value it, it's still going to, you know, there's knowing the difference or tasting the difference, but then understanding the value and that's the value. for a lot of people to- where they need that education. And kind of that's why I wanted to go, like I said, with this honey club, because I want to, I want to get people to know, you know, here's the honey, but then I'm there as the beekeeper, as a beekeeper to guide the discussion and say, do you know what it took for, you know, I bought this from like JP and I can get some honey from, uh, sent from him up here. Do you know what it took for him to get this? You know, where the source is for that. And I can make it personal to him. I can personalize that and localize that for them so they can get an appreciation of, oh, wow, this isn't just some mechanized fluid going through a bunch of pipes, you know, and into a a jar. It's, It's that, again, it's that, that custom craft kind of approach. Exactly. Exactly. And once beekeepers can tell that story, uh, they're not going to, they shouldn't have a problem selling their beautiful product. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Well, I got a, I got a, I got, I got one to throw in there. Um, with your, with your research and your, and, and this partly will maybe throw opinion in, more so than than science, but the general public has the understanding through whether it be given to, from their doctors or through their local sources that the honey produced within their literal backyard is supposed to be the utmost best for allergies. Now, I have stood on this, and I, I'll give my point of view so that you guys can tear it up or agree with. But the two things that I turn around and stand on is that honey production is a regional um, is a regional thing, meaning that I'm in North Alabama. So if I go to North Georgia or if I go to North Mississippi, 
Um, maybe so much as the very southern area like Chattanooga, Tennessee, that I feel that the honeys that I will that I make in my own personal backyard will be the um, basic equivalent to all those around me. That those same flowers and trees that are producing those nectars will be gathered by bees across that that region. So the the feeling that I have to get my honey within two miles of my house to be the most beneficial, I feel to be a little bit flawed when you can get those same flowers and floral productions in a wider area and still get those same benefits. Am I wrong for thinking that or am I possibly, you know, feeling that, that I'm giving the right information? Well, I have my opinion on it. Um, from doing a lot of tasting and buying and selling honey and also a lot of reading. So people, this is probably the second most popular question. The first popular, the first question most consumers ask is about crystallization, the misconception about crystallization, thinking that honey is old. The second most popular question by the public is I have to have local honey. And what you want is fresh raw honey. It really doesn't matter where it's from. It can be from France. It can be from, you know, your neighborhood. You want fresh honey because after about a year, honey starts to lose its benefits and the chemistry of honey starts to break down. It becomes darker. The HMF content goes up as the fructose breaks down and a lot of people say, well, I need the pollen from my local area. But in truth, there's only about 1% of pollen in honey. It's a very, very low percentage. So in order to get the benefits from the pollen, you would have to consume gallons of honey. But also the other thing that we don't talk about is the, chem the, the real benefits of honey come from the chemical composition, meaning Honey has a very low pH and a lot of bacteria cannot survive in an acidic environment. And then the bees are also adding in uh, some enzymes that create the hydrogen peroxide activity, um, the glucose oxidase turning into hydrogen peroxide. And then also it's uh, water drawing um, ability, it's hydroscopicity, meaning that honey is drawing water and uh, water is necessary for bacteria to grow. So when the water, when the honey is sucking the bacteria, the, the water from the bacteria, bacteria can't survive in honey. So there's basically three chemical um, activities that honey possess very uniquely, a unique food that gives the benefit. So, you know, from my experience, um, if I have a sore throat, and I have a favorite honey, and my favorite honey just happens to be from the Dakotas, and I consume it, I definitely feel relief. It doesn't, honey doesn't cure anything. It relieves symptoms. So if you're getting honey that is perfectly fresh, it really doesn't matter where it comes from because the chemical composition of honey is really uh, the same. And then people talk about Manuka honey. You've heard of Manuka from New Zealand, Australia. Yep. Now listen, wait, before you go down this road, <laughs> we have got very great, great friends of ours, which host a podcast out of New Zealand and they make Manuka honey. So I'm afraid Tony, Tony, we got a warner before she steps on any Manuka toes. This might not be good. I, am, I just say, I believe in Manuka. I've read a lot about it. I've had it. People in the U S talk about Manuka you know, it helped me. I love it. You know, it's very expensive, but it's not local. So how does the local story fit in? Manuka is beneficial. People swear on it, but it's not local. So really, you are looking at the chemical composition of a fresh raw product that's going to be beneficial to you. If it's local, that's great. Support your local beekeeper, reward them for their hard work, support your local economy. But in honesty, if I'm on vacation in Florida and I have a sore throat and I get some really fresh, raw orange blossom honey from the beekeeper at the farmer's market, it's going to help me. 
See now, so, I I think I'm I'm on I'm more on board. I know Gary and, and Margaret, you know, the Kiwi Mana, they're they're all in on this Manuka thing, you know. <clears throat> and but I'm kind of side with Imogene in 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 uh she's another one of our B hooligans from uh, Australia, and it's it's Jellybush honey all the way. I'm sorry, I, I've got to go with Jellybush honey. According to Imogen, by the way, it's Jellybush is the Manuka plant, but they can't, they're not allowed to call it Manuka yeah. because of that. So she calls it, they call it Jellybush. And I just exactly. love the name. So I just go, I'm like yeah. Jellybush honey. <laughs> and it's got, and it's got super, uh, super food properties and it's, oh, yeah. you know, worthy of, uh, you know, healing people for indigestion and stomach ulcers, but it's not local. So how do all these local, local vores explain that? It's the chemical composition of the manuka or the jelly bush honey um, that is giving you the real benefits. Exactly. Now we've got a couple so, minutes left, and I really, I, I, I I'm, I'm waiting. I, I've been, I've been biding my time because I want, I would love to hear your opinion. What kind of honey should should Yappy be using with chicken flavored ramen noodles? So chicken. Chicken and does the, is does, and does the the pasta ish or whatever it's made of <laughs> of the noodles does that change anything? Well, it's been a really long time since I've had ramen noodles, so I'm thinking that if I'm remembering, it's sort of a, a soupy broth yep. with the yes. curly, yeah, salty. curly noodles, salty. very salty. Yes, it won't go bad for about three hundred years in the package. Yeah. You know, I would, I mean, I think there's a couple different ways you can go. You can go with something sort of dark um, and sort of caramelly, like a uh, red bamboo or, or we, the Japanese knotwood. Or you can go with goldenrod. Do you know goldenrod is very flowery, which is great for fried chicken. Breaded and deep fried chicken goldenrod is wonderful on. Man, that's funny you bring that up. See, I'm in Goldenrod. Um, I'm I'm the epicenter of Goldenrod in North Alabama. That is our major major fall flow. And and what's funny is, is there are 64 uh, roughly 64 different varieties of Goldenrod in the state of Alabama. Wow. So at the oh, end of that conversation, the early the Goldenrod when it is being brought in, the pollens. I, I, I'm assuming it's more so the pollen maybe than the nectars, but I don't know. So I'll just leave it at that. But it literally gives off a a funky, mm -hmm. nasty, gym, <laughs> dirty gym socks smell yeah. to it. Yeah. So, But afterwards, it becomes more of a mellow, florally butterscotch after right. you crisped it and bottled it. So I, I know it's That's great with fried chicken. Okay. And and really honestly, you're describing my my spring honey to a T with the darker caramely color, um, which actually throws off of our main heavy flow producer in spring is privet. Uh, it's a invasive hedge that you know yeah. pretty much will take over anything. So I have always enjoyed privet and when privet is flowering, it almost smells like somebody somebody dropped a helium bomb in in North Alabama because it has got its own distinctive smell that yeah. I enjoy. Kind but, of like boxwood, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and like a cat pee kind of a. Smell. No, no, not uh, not really, not really. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, man, I, that's why. So the closest that I could ever describe it is helium. I mean, it okay. really just. I'm sorry, if but you, I hear if these you, descriptions no, yeah, just, and they just fit ramen noodles to me. I'm sorry. Yes, that's what I'm saying. But before, uh, before we jump off, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, I want to know about katsu honey. I know it. I know it's very invasive. The plant. Yes. Yes. Do you and produce I, that down there? Do you have any of that? Oh, sister, come on down. We have got we have got acres on it, and I literally, actually. Um, I'm in debate on kudzu honey, and, and and here's why. Yes, you can have 50 acres completely covered in kudzu, and it looks like this gigantic green field of yeah. beauty. All right, and the and the kudzu produces a little purple flower, which the bees can work that. The problem is 
is that it takes 50 acres to work, in my personal opinion, yeah. one hive of bees because it's just it, – it, as, as much as it's out there, I put it out there. I've literally got uh, 20 acres-ish across the road from – which is well within the area of where my bees would, would gather, and it's the late blooming – um, the time that it blooms is is actually in the fall. Well, I have yet to see my bees actually really working it or bringing it back. However, it has a grape flavor yes. to it. Go yes. So my real interest lies in obscure, rare, unusual honeys. And for me, katsu is a curiosity because I had done a lot of reading and tasted it once, but it's like a purple honey. It tastes like Jolly Rogers grape candy. And uh, I'm very interested in obscure, limited harvest uh, honeys that are produced around the U.S. and around the world. And katsu is one of the ones that's on my list of uh, trying to secure a jar of it and doing a, a tasting of it and sort of writing tasting notes about it. Right. Well, I can, I can, I can say that I would love to uh, accommodate you on that. However, um, I, here's to, to actually get just what would be the, the higher percentage of nothing but a kudzu honey. Mm -hmm. I would, I'm, I'm more worried about um, the, the the hot uh, the comb being used and 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 having previous honey flavors in it how that would affect it versus um uh trying to get that that heavy flow i tried putting bees on some of it this year and i just was not getting the production that i i thought i would but we also had limited rain so there was there's a there's a hard balance to try to get that that heavy enough flow to make it worth saying yeah, I've got nothing but but yeah, um, kudzu honey. Yeah, it's very interesting though. There's a lot of different plants around the U.S. Um, that make interesting honeys that we don't really see enough production that it would end up on the shelf of a grocery store. But you can find them, you know, at little farmers markets or you know obscure little towns. Uh, town markets where beekeepers are just producing interesting honeys. So that's really that's really what I enjoy is the new, you know, finding these new interesting honeys and tasting them and, and writing profiles for them and, uh, you know, identifying the story about the floral source and the region. And even the beekeeper has a great story, too. So. Well, I think Cut we may be in luck because, I mean, we literally at this point now have got thousands of listens to our podcasts. So who knows in when we air this uh, episode, we may have one of our listeners pop up and say, hey, I've got exactly what she's looking for. We might be able to hook you up there. You never that know. sounds great. Yeah, hey. I'm happy to do that for people if they have a really interesting honey. I've been doing a lot of uh, consulting with some companies and helping them to write tasting notes for their honey to help them, you know, better con talk to their consumer and communicate to the consumer what that honey might be great with, what kind of food, what kind of ingredients and recipes they can use that in. Um, and it's it helps with marketing. You know, beekeepers really need to, you know, be able to communicate to have a great marketing program. That is awesome. That is tremendous. You heard it here first, folks. There's your opportunity. If you're a big time uh, uh, producer of, of the, uh, the kudzu honey, give me a holler. You can get a hold of us at the uh, the Be Smart Beekeeping Project, and we might be able to make a connection, a honey connection. Uh, holy yeah. moly, I'm looking at the clock. We've just gotten all kinds of happy here. Uh, happy and yappy and everybody else. Uh, well, I would, I'm, I really want to say thanks. You, you've been an awesome, awesome guest on the podcast. We, we got all kinds of stuff and we were able to, we found out that Yappy's in, in ramen noodle honey central. He's got it made right where he is. So that worked out perfectly. Yeah. Uh, what do you got going the rest of the week real quick? Yeah. You're going to be busy. You ain't got a whole lot more bee stuff happening, uh, where you're at, do you? In Northern Alabama. No, we pretty, I've got everything. Pretty much set for the winter. Uh, I mean, I'm in that, you know, two finger lift test. Just walk around the back of the hives, make sure everybody's got 
you know, some weight to them and kind of keeping everything pretty much on the down low, um, keeping everything's put, you know, all the work's done, everything's put, put down and we're just kind of hoping winter is, is decent to us to get us through we till spring. Kind. I hear you. Marina, what do you got planned? You're a, you're a beekeeper. So what are you, are your bees in a good state right now? And you got big plans coming up for the next week or so you got the holidays coming. Yeah. Well, our bees are pretty much tucked in for the winter. Um, we had a dry summer, so uh, they ate up quite a lot of their stores. So we were feeding and we're still feeding. But uh, our weather has been a little crazy. We we had uh, like 30 degrees yesterday and today it's about 55. So our bees might be flying again. And they've been flying uh, most of October and parts of November, which is a little unusual. So we have to manage that, make sure that they don't eat up all their stores every time we have a nice day and they're out flying. And uh, for the holidays, I do a lot of uh, honey gift boxes and, and bee crafts. Hey, so that'll keep you busy. Yeah, busy as a bee. <laughs> you know, I do, I do a lot of consulting, so I'll be doing some traveling in the next uh, – I'll be at the American Bee Federation in Reno this year in January. We will keep an eye out for your activities then. See, uh, see how, how, how you get around and, and the places you get to visit will live vicariously through you. Yeah. Well, you should come <laughs> to the conference. Definitely. We can de- Well, I wish I could. Unfortunately, I have a lot. You're of closer to than I am. I don't know. I think, I think you're closer than I am to Reno. Oh my goodness. Reno. I can't even think of driving that far. Is it far? For me, it is. I don't ever get out of South Omaha. I'm a South Omaha boy. If I can't, if it takes me more than 20 miles, I just, it exhausts me just to think about it. <laughs> well, we'll be doing, I'll be doing some honey tasting there and uh, we'll be tasting and evaluating and learning about flavors. And hopefully people will be bringing in some samples of honey and we'll have a big honey tasting. Awesome. All right. Well, I have to wrap this up. We are a little over, but that's all right. It's always fun when we have plenty to talk about. I want to thank everybody out there uh, listening to the Be Smart podcast featuring the Be Hooligans. Uh, and, and stick tuned, stay tuned, because we got another couple of weeks. We're going to have another awesome episode out. And we got some more cool guests coming in. And so uh, don't, please, people, don't ever forget 